Cool. Okay, welcome everybody. My name is Bernie Maloney. Before we start, uh, and I tell you a little bit about my background and like what's going to go on here. In this virtual world, I like to share some stuff that I do for grins and giggles on my spare time, which is stuff about neuroscience and human communication. Something I know from that study is words alone only convey about 7% of the information um, before transmission loss error kicks in. Okay, transmission loss error is like playing the game of telephone that kids play and messages get corrupted. That's what transmission loss error is. Okay, uh, vocal qualities, things like rate of pace of speech. And yes, I can talk at different rates of pace of speech. Okay, uh, volume pitch. Those convey about 38% of the information. Loads of studies on this. The ones that I like to cite are out of uh, Bird Whistle and Moravian. Um, and the percentages vary, but the proportions are always about the same. Some of you are really good with math or you can see the pie chart that I'm sharing. And you're figuring out that, whoa, yeah, there's more than half the information is physiological in nature. Now, physiology goes way beyond things like um, body position. Have you ever heard that you only use two or five or 10% of your brain? That's your conscious mind. Okay, your unconscious mind is the rest of it. It's super powerful. It can pick up things even on Zoom as subtle as eye dilation. Okay, yep. Skin tone, that's like whether or not you're blushing and skin tone is, okay? That's like how tight your muscles are. So one of the things I recommend in this remote world is, look, if your camera's off, just recognize you're cutting off over half the information your brain thinks you're transmitting even before transmission loss error kicks in. So I recommend extend grace. Look, not everybody has a spare room that they can use as a studio like I do, nor do they have a $20 backdrop to hide all the clutter that's really on the other side, nor do they have to look camera ready every day like I do for what I do. Completely get it. So like extend grace. If somebody else's camera is off, extend grace. Recognize they're cutting off over half the information they think they're transmitting even before transmission loss error kicks in. Okay. So um, now I do want to let you know for speakers, it really does help if your camera is on. See, because uh, like I have all your pictures up in gallery view here in Zoom so I can see it. And if I explain things poorly, I get looks from people on camera like, what? And that's a clue that's really fast that like I need to do a whole lot better. So um, that's a little bit of background to kind of get us all on the same page as I start talking to you about making new mistakes. Okay, to get us started, before I kind of tell you where the title comes in, this is going to be a little bit interactive. You don't get out of one of my sessions without some interactivity. I'm just kind of that way. Even when it's a talk, you're going to be doing some stuff. Now, uh, there was a download that Sasha put up on the meetup group, and you can use that to take notes. But like this Menti poll is going to be one of the things of the ways that you can interact. So I'd love to have you go ahead and fire up Menti, pull up your phone right now. Um, and this is just to kind of be sure that things are working because I'm going to have a couple of questions and be able to show some live polls as we go through. Um, so like as you look at this, like what do you prefer, Star Wars or Star Trek? Doesn't matter. You know, we were just past May the 4th. So may the 4th be with you. I can do that too, both hands. Okay, <clears throat> so um, let me tell you a little bit about me. So I'm a trainer, a speaker, and a coach. Uh, like Sasha, I'm a member of Scrum Alliance. I carry a CST credential. So even if this wasn't a Scrum user group, uh, what Scrum Alliance tells me is because like Sasha and I with our credentials are here, it actually counts for Scrum education units. So if any of you are looking for that, cool. Um, if any of you need PMP stuff, uh, I've got a page on my website. Sasha, I can pass it to you. You can put it on to uh, meet up. I, I think I've got it on my, my website or I email it out to folks. I can email it out to you. You just got to fill in your own PMP papers because I'm not a uh, uh, registered education provider with PM uh, with PMI. Okay. Awesome. So y'all that's working for you. You can keep answering that poll. Look, I do. I told you I do interesting stuff, y'all. Yes, that really is me there in the middle. Okay. Yes, I really have danced hula. Yes, I really did ink that pa'u myself. That's what you call the skirt. Okay, I've danced Tula a couple of different times. Um, where people tend to think of me as a trainer, they might see me as a coach. What I really do with clients is I help them achieve performance breakthroughs with their teams, their organizations, and sometimes even themselves. That's where some of that stuff that I talk to you about, 
um, about communication. That's just a little bit of the sliver of stuff that I've got there on the table. Now, I'm going to talk to you all about tonight about making new mistakes. These are some success stories from a billion dollar a quarter business that I was actually in. To get us started, okay, I've got another question in the mentee poll. So if you're already in there, great, love to have your answer to this. Um, if you're not, you can shoot this QR code or you can put the digits in that are up at the top at menti.com to go ahead and answer this question. And what I'd like to get a sense from y'all while I tell you a little bit about my background um, is what's the biggest business mistake you personally have made that's been forgiven by management? See, I kind of cut my teeth in Agile and in the consumer PC business at HP about 25 years ago. It's really scary to say that I've been practicing Agile for 25 years. Now, 25 years ago, consumer PCs, they were desk side PCs. They had a lot of sheet metal in them. Sheet metal, y'all, I'm a mechanical engineer by training. So I tend to think about this Agile stuff way differently than software people. Uh, sheet metal has about a 14 month lead time before things can like get into your hands. Uh, motherboards have about a nine month lead time, but the shelf life of a consumer PC is only about three months because Intel changes their roadmap every three months. Wait, it gets even more exciting than that. If you didn't get things like into retail when you said you would, it wasn't like you missed one week of your addressable market. It was more like you missed 30% of your total addressable market. So just a little bit of time pressure going on here. Um, while I was there, we grew that business from shipping six products a quarter to 20 in the U.S. to, by the time I left after eight years, uh, 200 a quarter in Europe alone. Okay, so high complexity. We did it with distributed teams. We had volume manufacturing in Asia. We had engineering in California. We had go-to-market for Europe in Grenoble, France. Okay, um, so we did it not only with those tight timelines, um, not only like with those distributed teams, not only with that high complexity, we did it in high volume. You ever buy one of those products at Christmas that has a really good price to it? Okay, so um, those are called Black Friday. Uh, if you're not here in the US, it's kind of a American hegemony that goes on. So um, some of those would have 100,000 units in a single model run. Mm. Okay, so high volume. Um, tight margins. OK, because it is a business. So um, on a most technology businesses want to have 20 to 30 percent gross margins. Um, and that's gross margins is before you start taking off deductions, things like uh, salaries and expenses and things like that. On a good day, we had eight percent gross margins. OK, for some of our Black Friday SKUs, we had two percent gross margins. We used to refer to it as we were shipping rotting bananas, that if we made the call wrong, we would need to staple 20 to $100 bills, okay, to every single unit as a discount to clear them out before the next one showed up. So I'm telling you this so you kind of know a little bit about the business and the background that's there. Because I'm going to talk to you about what made that success. It was the fastest division in HP's history to hit a billion dollars in sales. Okay, <clears throat> and um, I made a, a million dollar mistake that was forgiven. That organization knew that with those tight timelines, that high complexity, okay, those tight margins, occasionally mistakes would be made. So they had an ethic of make new mistakes. And what that was, was if you made a mistake and it was honest, it'd be forgiven. But you better learn the lesson because we don't want to see you do that again. So um, we were getting ready for one model run, okay, one quarter's model run. And to be able to meet our timeline, look, all management was out of the building. They were unreachable. This is back around 2000. Not everybody carried cell phones yet. Uh, and uh, so we needed to make a component buy to be able to ship a certain feature in PCs on the timeline that we needed to. I was the one who had to make the call, okay? And I knew because our business really was on that tight timeline, we needed to have those options. And I knew that we had that philosophy of make new mistakes, okay? And it was the wrong call. I made that on Friday and I knew by Monday, if it was the wrong call, we to sell those components back in, we'd have to take a million dollar write down. And it was the wrong call and we had to take a million dollar write down. Oh. 
Okay. It was not a comfortable debrief from that situation. But at the end, at that retrospective, the general manager um, who had originally been the engineering director, but had gone off, done some other stuff, come back as the second general manager. So this wasn't the founder of this division. He said, well, let's make new mistakes. Okay. So I've literally made a million dollar mistake and I was forgiven. And that introduces one of the success factors that I want to talk to you about tonight, which is psychological safety. Okay. So that philosophy of make new mistakes really established in that organization that honest mistakes would be tolerated. Okay. And so long as you didn't make them again. And I want to introduce you to a familiar practice to a lot of folks as agilists. The failure bow comes from going to the circus where you might see an aerialist land a jump and they take a big showy bow and the band plays as they take that big showy bow. What they're doing is they're admitting to their peers that they just made a mistake. So I do this, y'all, with every workshop, whether it's sea level or not, okay? I do it with a lot of my talks. We're going to do it here, okay? So I'd like some audience participation with y'all. Okay. Uh, even if you're not on camera, I'd like you to open your microphones so that we can hear you. I'd love to have you put yourselves into gallery view so you can see what's going on with other folks. I'm going to stop my sharing here for a second. Um, and I'm going to teach you my version of a failure bout. You're going to need to have a little bit of space around yourself where you can put one foot forward. Okay. And you can throw both hands in the air at the same time. And on the count of three, you're going to put that one foot forward. You're going to throw both hands in the air at the same time. And you're going to repeat after me. So microphones open, everybody. Moshe, Logan, Andy, come on, Miguel, Anil, Peter, Doug. Here we go. Ready? One, two, Three. I fail. Oh. I fail. <laughs> oh, okay. So let me unpack that a little bit for you about psychological safety. What you're doing is you're sending to the group a whole big message that, hey, I'm a human being just like you. I make mistakes just like you. I do the same thing with C-level executives, y'all. They do the same thing you did. Wait, whoa, what's this guy doing? And then I teach them a little trick about leadership. See, the only true test of power is the ability to give it away. And when you're doing a failure bow, that's what you're doing. You're getting vulnerable. You're letting other people know, hey, I'm a human being just like you. You're helping to shift the organization from being human doings to being human beings and you're introducing psychological safety. If you've never encountered um, the Aristotle project from Google, I really recommend you go look at it because they looked at high performing teams and they found it really wasn't the skill of people on a team that made the difference for high performance. It was actually psychological safety. So in that organization, because we knew we'd be forgiven for honest mistakes, we already had an environment of deep psychological safety. You're probably also familiar with Simon Sinek. You've probably seen his Start With Why talk, but there's a really good quote in there that a team is not a group of people who work together. A team is a group of people who trust each other. So that video is so rich, I pretty much go back and watch it every year. This is what you want to be doing with your teams for high performance and for success. That's the first hint is you want to introduce psychological safety. Now, some people are going, I work in a big old corporation and it's really hard to change culture. Indeed it is. That's actually what we're doing with Agile is we're shifting culture and that's hard. Okay. But one of the things you can do is you can establish a climate within the group that you're working with. That's where you can start to build psychological safety. So you can start small with your local groups. Just start teaching failure bows, okay? Get people to trust each other and treat themselves like human beings instead of like human doings. And that's going to help your organization. So now back to Menti, how would you currently rate psychological safety in your organization? Also, if you got the handout here, what I'd recommend you do is pull that handout out okay, and um, go ahead and rate yourself and your organization for psychological safety. Okay. 
This is a little introspective the way that um, I tend to do um, this talk when I do it online. Okay, so that's my first hint for you. Now, um, moving forward. Okay, that was there as a pause for y'all to rate your own psychological safety. So here's another hint, have a clear purpose. And a way to do this is what's your why? Honestly, what I would say, well, now let me tell you a little bit of story. Um, so in that division at HP that I just told you about, when I joined, we had a really clear purpose. Remember, this is back in the late 90s when there were manufacturers that you don't see anymore for consumer PCs like Packard Bell. You all remember them? Okay. So, um, and HP was like the number five vendor at this time. Uh, and so we had a really clear purpose, beat Compaq, who was the number one vendor at the time. This is pre-merger. So that really established clarity for us about where we want to go. In fact, clear intent is the number one thing I work on with my Agile clients. So many organizations that I work with, they don't have clear intent. And I'm going to unpack that for you because there's a bunch of different ways that you have intent. Like I'll start with a definition of done. See, a lot of organizations, um, they really, this is, this is an analogy for Agile and Agile organizations that I really like. It's the Mobius Loop. It's from Gabby Benefield. She's out of the UK. So I love this for several reasons because everybody gets the whole idea of the back and forth of the Mobius Loop. But most organizations think Agile is really only the right-hand half of this Mobius Loop. Build, measure, learn, build, measure, learn, build, measure, learn, because they read Eric Ries and they get caught in what Melissa Perry calls the build trap. They completely miss that Agile is also the left-hand half of this as well. See, the right-hand half is all about the delivery of a solution. But Agile, okay, is also about the discovery of the problem to solve and who to solve it for. And too many organizations underinvest in this. This is why the role of a product owner is so critical. So um, look, you've probably seen planning onions like this before. And product owners kind of live their life back and forth on this planning onion from the concrete now, which is where everybody like kind of gets caught up in the build trap out through the next to the later and into the future. And when things get out there, they're really big and vague. In fact, they get even more vague when you start throwing in terms like strategy and purpose. See, Scrum vision is something that's long-term and ever evolving. You're probably never going to achieve it. Think of it like you came out of high school and you had a vision for what you wanted to have for a career. Now, personally, I'm on my fifth career and I still haven't become an astronaut. Okay. But things that are closer in, they're more concrete. So it helps to kind of get some ideas about this stuff that's way out there in the distance. Vision is all about the what do you want to build? Purpose is all about the why do you want it? And strategy is all about the how are you going to go about fulfilling that? As you start to get clarity on those, then you can start to set product and sprint goals. Okay, so product goals, they're medium to long-term tangible future states of the product, a clear target for your team to plan against. And sprint goals, what they do is they drive cohesion and focus during the sprint towards delivering an increment of value that you can use to measure progress towards that product goal. And once you start to get clarity on your product goals, well, then you can commission a team to go after that goal because they've got a clear why, something that's going to be guiding them, a North Star like Beat Compact. And then they can start to implement tactics. Now, uh, if you watch Simon Sinek start with why, there's a really good quote in there that Dr. Martin Luther King, okay, on the National Mall, 1963, um, gave, you know, gave a speech, got 300,000 people there pre-internet, pre-fax, pre-cheap telephone calls. And Sinek asks, how did he do it? And he points out that Dr. King gave the I have a dream speech, not the I have a plan speech. See, when you give people a plan and predict, they're going to work for a paycheck. But when you give them a dream, when you give them a clear why, they start to engage with their emotions, with their blood, their sweat, and their tears. I talked to product owners. And it's like, what type of an organization do you want to be in? 
And I want to encourage you to have clarity about why and purpose. Because, okay, as you start to go back to this Mobius loop, some of the ways that Scrum and Agile already start to talk about clarity of purpose are you want to get an idea of what you want to build. And things like vision and product goal and sprint goal, but too many organizations just use that in delivery. They completely miss the importance of having that over in discovery, okay? Because too many organizations are only focused on using Agile for exploitation of a known idea, and they completely miss the power of exploration. See, one of the things you want to do is you want to shift from giving your teams solutions to build and instead give your teams problems to solve. When you start to do that, you're starting to get an idea like from this planning onion of how that Mobius loop kind of overlays on top of it, aren't you? Well, really what you're doing with Agile as you go along is early on, there's going to be a whole lot of uncertainty in the system. And the job of a product owner is to squeeze that uncertainty out of the system. Early on, that uncertainty is going to be around who's our customer, what's their problem to solve. Later on, you might get to some technical uncertainty. Have you all ever heard of spikes? Show of hands. Yeah, spikes is just technical uncertainty. So when I have clients who get wrapped around the axle with spikes, I just kind of frame it up as technical uncertainty. That's really what we're doing here. Okay. And to help get through this, it really helps to have those vision, those sprint, and those product goals there. See, great leaders give us something to believe in, not something to do. So what I'd like you to do is pull out a sheet of paper if you didn't get the handout. Spend a moment reflecting. How are you going to clarify why in your own organization? Okay. What is your organization's current why? If it's not clear, who at work are you going to spend some time and talk about it with? So simply by starting to frame things up as problems to solve, you're going to be starting to give your teams a why. If you're familiar with the user story format, that's actually what you're doing with the user story format. You're talking about the problem to solve. Okay, that's my second hint. I got to ask you all, would it be okay if I snuck in an extra one on you at some point? Like I promised you five, would it be okay if I gave you six hints? Okay, not an excited audience. Great, they only want five. Got it. Okay, I'm good. Okay, so now here's my third hint, stable teams. Okay, I want to tell you another story out of that business. Um, so you kind of got the idea that that business was pretty fast moving. So um, in fact, those Black Friday SKUs that I talked about, they're usually on a ship um, out of Asia sometime no later than the first week of September to be able, because it takes about eight weeks, or sorry, it takes about four weeks to cross the ocean, whether that's to Europe or to Asia or, or to the US. And then it takes about four weeks to truck ship into all of your retail hubs. So it's about an eight week lead time and you got to get it in there before those sales start to kick in in November. So in fact, for those Black Friday SKUs, you've built everything before you know if anything is going to sell. That's kind of the environment that we were in. Um, and we came to one release cycle. We'd already started our pilot run. We'd already built our first 200 units. When we found out that Compaq, we still weren't merged at this point. Um, Compaq was going to be shipping. Wait, dig this, y'all. Okay. We were shipping a 799 PC that had dig this eight megabytes of RAM in it. But we found out at that same price point, Compaq was going to be shipping 16. And so we knew that if we continued, we would be shipping bricks. 
Okay. Nobody would buy them. And oh my gosh, the discount that we would have to do. So we had to pivot and we had to pivot really fast. Now, because we had stable teams who were used to this, it was really easy. Everybody knew how the pieces fit together. And what we were able to do is sequester those first 200 units. We worked with our supply chain people to go start grabbing memory that we had. We had been planning to have two dim slots for memory in those and put eight megabytes in one and leave an expansion port for the future. We started pulling eight megabyte slots and we were double stuffing it to get to 16 megabytes. We had to reprint all of the cartons because we had the specs on the cartons. Okay. And then we had to back order additional memory. We didn't miss our ship date. We got things into retail on time. In fact, in the eight years I was there, we never missed a ship date. And that was due to having stable teams. Y'all are probably familiar with Bruce Tuckman's language of forming, storming, norming, and performing. But I actually prefer Virginia Satir's model. Okay, she talks about it as you're going along, you got a certain status quo. Okay, and then a foreign element enters and you descend into chaos. Okay, before you have a transformative idea and then you rise to a new status quo. Both of them were just psychologists and they were just describing human systems. This goes on in every human system. Okay. And this is something that I like to share with every client, with every class that I teach, because I find when I share this early on, what happens is when things go sideways, people kind of go, I guess we're in storming and they move right through it. So having stable teams helps even letting them know that this stuff is going to happen. This is, this is just a normal human system. Think of what happens in January. Any of y'all make new year's resolutions? You know, like the classic, ah, I'm going to get fit and healthy. It's beach body time. You know, we're out of COVID. Okay. And then you get a couple of weeks in and it's like, oh, this is so hard. And what do human beings want to do? They want to go back to the way things were. So by knowing that if you press through, you can get to that new level of performance, it really helps. And stable teams, it takes them three to five iterations, we all know, to get there. So um, this comes in with the same idea of discovery and delivery. Too many organizations, because they just treat people like human doings, like cogs in a machine, build, measure, learn, build, measure, learn, build, measure, learn exploiting a known idea, okay? Anytime you're switching people between teams, both teams go through that forming, storming, norming curve. And you're actually gonna reduce performance. This is another reason why you wanna focus on solutions to build, or sorry, on problems to solve rather than just solutions to build because people aren't fungible. Okay, now for my next Menti question, what would you all say? Where does your organization fall in the range of more problems to solve, okay, versus more solutions to build? And if you're taking notes on the handout or just on a sheet of paper, who are you going to talk to about this when you're back at work? Part of the reason for this, y'all, is most organizational cultures, remember I talked about that whole culture thing? They were formed before the internet. Wow. A really handy guideline that you can use. Um, so organizations that were formed before the internet, they were formed in a slow moving environment where you could plan and predict. That's one era of culture. Another era of culture is those that were formed um, in the internet, but not the cloud. Okay, so... Things that were formed before the internet, finance, government, uh, military, pharma, um, automotive, oil fields, okay? They were formed in a plan and predict world in the industrial era economy where you can plan and predict. Okay, and then organizations that were born in the cloud, they also have problems with agile. So if you're here in the Valley and you ever been around Cisco or PayPal, hmm, hmm, what, am I, what am I talking to you about? Okay, cool. Organizations that were born in the cloud, they're almost natively agile because they were born after, okay, the Agile Manifesto. They already had these ideas in there. So that really helps them as well. See, most organizations have that, we're going to treat the whole system like a machine and plan and predict it. 
And in a fast moving environment, hmm. that's something different. Let me ask y'all, I'm gonna do a thumb vote with this because I'm gonna do it on the fly. Um, for those of you, especially on camera, you can also do this with emoticons. Um, the markets that you serve, no matter what business that you're in, would you say they're moving faster, thumbs up or slower, thumbs down than they were say five or 10 years ago? What would you say? Oh, people give me fast or awesome. The, um, the technology that you use to serve those markets, uh, would you say it's moving faster, thumbs up, slower, thumbs down than it was five or 10 years ago? What would you say? Faster. Let me ask you, when things move fast, do they always yes for thumbs up, no for thumbs down, move in a straight line? No. Okay, cool. So if things are moving faster and they're not moving in a straight line, are they easier thumbs up or harder thumbs down to plan and predict? Harder. But most of your organizations are still trying to plan and predict things, aren't they? It's because their culture was formed before the internet in that plan and predict world. So that's why you want to start talking about these things with your organization. Okay, that's my third hint. Now, on to my fourth hint. Poof, you've had some time to reflect on how stable are your teams. Another thing you want to do, okay, is you want to grow the leadership style. I'm going to tell you another little story. So that fast moving environment. Um, look, at one point in my career, y'all, I was tactically responsible for the delivery of 2% of HP's top line revenue. That was only a billion dollars a quarter. And we did that with weekly iterations of a plan, okay? Um, with uh, distributed teams, okay? High volume, high mix, low margin. Okay. Uh, and I had zero direct reports. That 2% of HP's revenue, revenue, it was only a billion dollars a quarter. So I wanna let you all know, I'm pretty confident that Agile works because everything we did there maps to Scrum. I can map it there. And a big lesson that I learned was I needed to grow my leadership style. So I'd been there, I had some success and it was time for annual eval. Y'all ever get annual evals? Yeah, my boss did me a solid. He said, I got some feedback from some people. I'm not gonna put it in, but you need to hear it. And from two people and from the way it was phrased, um, I could kind of tell who they were, but didn't hold it against them. I'm glad they did. They said, if Bernie's here a year from now, I won't be. Oh. Okay, that told me something was up and I needed to get help. I needed to grow my leadership style. Luckily, I found something from UC Santa Cruz that they had suitcased in from UC Irvine that was about technical, well, not technical, but technology leadership. And in the this was a eight hour a week program for six months plus homework. In the very first lesson, they taught me about situational leadership, and this literally saved my career. So situational leadership has about 40 years of data behind it. See, most leaders, they only think about the direction axis, okay? We're going to tell people what to do, or we're going to let them go. We're going to tell people what to do, we're going to let them go. But situational leadership actually blends in. You've got to have a dimension of support as well. So when people start out, direction is really the right thing to do. Um, think of kids when they make the Little League team, you know, woo they've got high confidence about it, but they've got low competence. I made the team, terrific. Okay, run 10 laps. Highly directive leadership style. As your followers build competence, okay, their confidence will wane. They'll, they'll hit a plateau. And it might be, you know, coach, no matter what I do, I just can't like put a bat on the ball. You're doing fine. A little bit of support. Now, um, you know, give me 20 push-ups. Build up, build up some of that strength. The conversations shift here. Okay. In fact, they follow a pattern. Early on, you're going to start out in direction, but you want to start moving into coaching, okay, as a stance. And the conversations kind of shift from I talk, I decide to we talk, I decide as a leader, to we talk, you decide as you're supporting them. That's a mentoring conversation. You know, when I played the game, until finally you can get them over to delegation. See, the mistake I was making is I was only going direction, delegation, direction, delegation. And when things didn't work, I went back to direction. I literally had somebody say, Bernie, you're getting in my shorts. And I was like, absolutely. Okay. I was kind of insensitive then. I've learned some lessons since then. 
what you're really doing with Agile is you're shifting your followers from task and output focused to result and outcome focused. This is another reason why you want to give your teams problems to solve rather than solutions to build. You also want to adjust your leadership style, and this is something you can do dynamically. In fact, um, you can use it as a follower style. Like if somebody tries to dump and run on you, wait, 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 wait. You can actually pull them back up and get the support that you need. I have another story from that out of HP, but I won't bore you with it. Instead, I'll kind of take you into this part of the poll. What would you say is your current leadership style? Take some notes. Um, what steps will you take to grow it and expand your flexibility with other leadership styles? What steps will you take for your own organization? Okay, we got eight people responding to the polls. Thank you. Appreciate that. Recognize that mentoring isn't the only stance that you should be taking. So, Ram, I'm talking here specifically about situational leadership. I don't know what they say about that. So I'm kind of giving you a framework that you can use. If you actually have a self-directed team, yeah, we talk, we decide, can absolutely work. But I'm going to give you some clues about that, going back to some of that mm, plan and predict mentality in an organization um, that kind of thinks like a machine, but we haven't quite gotten there yet. Okay. So that gives you some time to think about how you're going to help grow leadership style for yourself and your organization. Okay. So next hint, um, you want to enable self-directed decisions. And to do that, you want to clarify decision-making authority. Okay. So this is in part like to what Ram was talking about. So got to remember that Agile's goal is to get to self-directed teams. Okay. You decide, I trust you. So Ram, that's kind of like right up there with we decide. Okay. We talk. You're letting the team make that decide. So one of the things you need to do is you need to build trust. Show the teams how to make decisions. Now I'm going to give you a couple of ways that you can do that. Some of them are probably going to be familiar. So RACI charts can be really handy. If you've never seen RACI charts, okay, they stand for responsible, accountable, consulted, and informed. Okay, and this even applies to leaders. Okay, you know how stakeholders, like they always have opinions the way people have say noses? Okay, you, you know how there are just some stakeholders that are just consulted and informed? Like, what would you like? Okay, this is what you're going to get. So if you're a product owner, you want to identify them, okay? Versus the ones that have influence, okay? The ones that have interest. So with a team, if you can start to map this out, even in like a complex environment, like we had at HP, you might also hear this called a DACI. So it's the same concepts. They just use the word decider in slightly different ways. That whole idea of accountable is the single, okay, I don't like the neck to choke analogy. That's why I like the hand to shake analogy. It's much more congratulatory. But that decider, that red one, that one's the one who's responsible for consequences. Typically in an organization, these things are going to be super convoluted. Ideally, what you want to be doing is teasing these things apart. Okay, but practically, okay, if you can get at least the informed people separated from the rest, it's going to make life so much easier. One of the ways of doing that, like this is a real life example of a racy chart from that organization I told you about. And it kind of shows you how that responsibility shifted over time. Now it's hardware. Hardware has stage gates, y'all. Okay. Let me ask y'all, uh, you're familiar with startups? Yes? No? Maybe so? Okay, cool. Okay. Would you say startups are agile? You know, thumbs up or um, not so agile? Thumbs down. What would you say? Cool. Okay. For those of you who are already familiar with startups, have you ever heard of funding rounds? Yes? No? Well, you know what funding rounds are? They're stage gates. Because what you do with a startup is you fund them to go figure out a problem to solve. So they're direct analogies, even when you got hardware. 
If you're not familiar with hardware development, concept gate review, investigation gate review, design gate review, release to QA, software people call that first customer ship, MR, manufacturing release, or sorry, uh, uh, functionally complete, complete MR, uh, manufacturing release, FCS, first customer ship, end of life, end of production life, we're not going to produce anymore, EOSL, end of service life. So things can shift over time, but having clarity on this, we know who's making the calls and who's doing the work and who just gets to voice and who just gets to listen. Now, another way that you can make this stuff clear is you can use delegation boards. This is a technique that comes out of management 3.0. So there's a range, okay, of the way that you interact from, it's kind of like a rainbow, all the way from tell where decisions are fully made by the manager role all the way to delegate where there's no manager influence and you let the team work it out. And one of the things you can do with a delegation board is figure out some of the common decisions that are going to need to be made and then get real clear which, you know, what degree of freedom does the team have to make decisions on their own. So, pull out your notes. If you can, write down three common decisions in your organization. Okay. I'll put this range back up. Like, where would you say they are on this range right now? And where would the desired state be for those common decisions on that range? And then let me give you a minute to think, how will you share this structure when you're back at work? And while you do that, I want to go back to something that Maru said. Um, you think mentoring and coaching should be switched. So you're dealing with a way that probably Lisa Adkins and Michael Spade define mentoring and coaching. I am giving you information out of situational leadership. So I understand your point, but there's no absolute here. Recognize there are two different ways of looking at this. So both of those paradigms apply those words differently. Words have no meaning, y'all. They only have the meaning that we mutually agree to. I can get deep into metaphysics if you really want me to. Cool. Okay. So let me see how many more I got. Oh, yeah, I got, I got one more that's like a really good one before I wrap up. But I think I've already given you five, haven't I? You want more, one more really good one? Another thing you want to do with your teams, oops, got too far there. Let me go back. You want to see the whole. You want to help teams evolve by design versus by default. Okay. Too many organizations evolve solely by default. So when you start to look at a tech organization early on, okay, a lot of like startups will start around a couple of founders, typically. Somebody who's market focused, somebody who's technology focused. This is a common pattern. And this really broke through for me when I was at TiVo and they had three different ways of running projects. And it just made no sense to me because I've been running billion dollar a quarter product lines back at HP. And I only needed to talk to four to 10 people to be able to do that, even in a 400 person organization. So having three different ways of running things, just, it, it didn't make sense to me. But then I read a couple of things, one that came out of Founders Institute, okay, and another thing that came out of um, the Startup Genome Project that's now known as Compass.co. And they were both looking at startups, and they found that startups uh, uh, that scaled up, that had success, had a slightly different pattern. So a lot of startups start this way. And then as you build the business out, you get a whole lot more specialization in there. And larger and later, it gets even more specialized. And frankly, coordinating this stuff gets to be really complex. So what a lot of organizations do is they abstract the pattern by going back to the way they were founded. And they only tend to think about market and technology. This is one of the reasons why startups fail. See, startups are there to figure out a problem to solve. Okay, Steve Blank will tell you that. Okay, but big businesses, they're actually there to run things. So most startups, most organizations, they just carry that pattern forward. And what you really want to do is you want to start thinking about the long term. There's another dimension here, which is run. 
You've still got some market facing stuff with support. You've still got some technology facing stuff with operations. For us in HP, that was manufacturing. In TiVo, it was manufacturing. Okay. This is where DevOps came up, y'all. Because Agile only talked about software development. It didn't talk about software operations. So you'll also notice that there are some other functions that are over there. General and administrative functions like finance, legal, and HR. Let me ask you something, rhetorical question. Why does an organization have HR, human relations? Frankly, it's to keep the organization from getting sued. Okay. Why does an organization have finance? Well, duh, we've got financial reporting laws. Okay, how about why, why do we have legal? Well, duh, legal. You can, you can tell that those are kind of defensive-based positions. So this is something you want to do with your organization is you want to see the whole. You want to apply that lean principle. And you want to be looking at both market facing and technology facing. You want to be looking at creating stuff and operating stuff. And you also want to be looking at things as both your defensive and your offensive teams. Okay. Anybody here a PMP? Cool. Okay. Y'all know the iron triangle, right? Okay. So would you agree with me that it's like um, schedule, budget, and scope? Fair. Okay, cool. So let's talk about that. Okay, so um, scope of work. Well, guess what? That's just a legal question. Hey, what's our scope of work that we're negotiating here? Okay. Um, so, okay, what's our budget or what's our accrued value? That's a financial question. Okay. Um, what are we staffing for this project so we can plan out our schedule? Well, that's an HR question. A lot of project managers come with a defensive-minded mindset, and Agile is your offensive team. This is one of the reasons why project thinking struggles in these fast-moving environments, because it was built in a plan-and-predict world. So one of the things you want to do is you want to see the whole for your organization. Now, one of the things I'd like you to do is if you don't have the handout, draw this diagram, even just these two axes and the four quadrants that are there. And then like take a couple of groups in your organization and map them on there. Circle some areas where you recognize there's some gaps. Put a box around some of the recognized problems that you have. As you think this thing through more completely, how are you going to cross-check your perspective in your organization? And ask yourself, how are you going to apply this model to close a gap or address a problem that you recognize in your organization? So Maru, instead of um, situational leadership, I'd say grow your leadership style. And situational leadership is one of the ways that you can do that. Cool. Okay. So, uh, and then just to go back, since Maru's taking notes, it's psychological safety. Okay. Um, have a clear why, clear goals. Okay. Um, have stable teams, grow your leadership style, enable self-directed decision-making. So Maru, that's the one that you hadn't caught yet. Cool. And see the whole. Okay. Now, let me summarize it for you. The big picture here is what you want to be doing is you want to shift the organization's being rather than doing. And some ways that you can do that are psychological safety. Remember, a team is not a group of people who work together. A team is a group of people who trust each other. And what you're really doing with Agile is you're shifting a culture. Culture is hard, y'all. Okay? But one of the ways that you can start shifting a culture, this is proven through anthropology, is start changing the language. Okay. And this is something you can start to do in your own little area with climate. Like instead of calling people resources, call them people. That's pretty common in Agile. Let me ask you all, do any of y'all talk about efficiency in your organization? 
Scrum is not efficient, y'all. Efficiency is about the utilization of capacity. Okay, let me give you an example. Efficient use of a highway, put as many cars onto it as you possibly can, and then you get a three-day traffic jam like they do in China. Okay, but effective use of a highway, that's what Agile is all about, is effectiveness, okay? The delivery of value, getting vehicles from place to place. Okay. Let me ask you, okay, e efficiency, that's the language of machines. Utilization, twice the work in half the time. I'm really not fond of that title. Okay. Let me ask you, do you go to your doctor for an efficient treatment or an effective treatment? Okay, effectiveness is what you really wanna focus on, the delivery of value. That's the language of organisms versus the language of mechanisms. That's one of the ways you can start shifting the culture. Okay, another hint, have a clear purpose. Okay, so really great leaders give us something to believe in, not merely something to do. Do whatever you can to start helping your teams understand the why. Give them vision, give them product, give them sprint goals. It gives them a target to aim at, something to drive together. Karen, I'll take questions at the end. I, I completely see it. Okay, another hint, stable teams. Okay, recognize if you're moving people back and forth like cogs in a machine, both groups of people are gonna go through this forming, storming, norming curve, and you're actually gonna re, uh, lose some productivity. I've got exercises that I can show you that if you simply apply the scrum value of focus, like show of hands, how many of your organizations would like to have a 10% improvement in effectiveness? Anybody? Super easy. Start eliminating handoffs. Here's what's actually possible, two to five X. If you go search the internet, you're gonna find out that Google talks about 10 X, not 10%. It's absolutely possible. And one of the ways to do that is not only stop having handoffs, but also have stable teams that are cross-functional that can deliver thin vertical slices of value. Um, grow your own leadership style. What you wanna be doing and what you wanna be helping leaders in your organization do is shift from direction to delegation. And to do that, they're gonna need to develop some support skills, okay? One of the things um, for PMs, like they get threatened by Agile, because they're used to telling people what to do in a plan and predict world. And one of the things I tell them is you get to grow some second level management skills. Show of hands, any of y'all ever been a second level manager? Okay, cool. Andy, you might like back me up on this. There's a really good book that I recommend or uh, Rajiv Peshawaria's too, uh, too Many Bosses, Too Few Leaders. And he makes two big points in that book. One, um, he says, the hardest transition to make in management is when you go from first line to second line, because as a first line manager, you can actually help the team. You can still pitch in. But as a second line manager, you got to let go. Andy, would you agree? Yeah. The other thing that he says is there's no model for how to do this in industry. Adios, my friend, you're on your own. You've got to go find your own mentor. So one of the things when you introduce Agile into an organization and you want like the teams to be self-directed, project managers get a little nervous, okay? And often they go into uh, micromanagement and high direction. One of the things I tell them is you get to develop second level management skills. You get to develop these coaching and mentoring skills in Maru, even if you like switch things back and forth, okay? So second level coaching skills with support really help for leadership, okay? Another thing you want to do is you want to enable self-directed decisions, okay? And a couple of ways you can do that are through racy charts or delegation boards. Another thing um, is you want to see the whole. You want to apply lean, okay? You want to map out your whole organization, both your offensive and your defensive teams. Recognize that it's not just technology and market, but there's also start and creation and run and operation that goes in. I've actually used this model, y'all, all the way down to four-person teams. Okay, and through every business I've been in since I created it. It is Creative Commons licensed. You're welcome to share. Okay, you just have to give attribution and no derivatives. So you really got to remember, great leaders give us something to believe in, not something to do. The big influence levers in Agile, okay, 
every organization, it has a certain amount of inertia. That's what's over here on the left. And agile, the tools, the processes, the practices, they're terrific, they're very visible, but they often aren't enough to make the change because the organization like that satire curve has some organizational resistance and it wants to go back to the way it was. This is why you get agile that gets adopted in command and control. What you really need to do is you need to stretch a little bit further out and start changing the culture. And to do that, start talking about values and principles. Really what you wanna be doing is changing the mindset. And as you do that, you move to a more resilient learning organization. We all know that. It's way more valuable, but it's way less visible. And it makes those plan and predict organizations that think like mechanisms super uncomfortable because it's very squishy. So one of the things that I do is I start to break down mindset into both beliefs and behaviors. When you start shifting people's beliefs, huh, things change. Let me ask you all, yes, no, maybe so. Based on what you've heard here tonight, do you believe more is actually possible? Yes, no, maybe so. Cool. See, I've already started to shift your beliefs. And when you do that, now you've earned the right to start advocating for people to shift their behaviors, maybe to some more of those agile practices and principles that are there. See, doing agile appears easy and it is. Look, Scrum, 65% in the most recent survey of teams that are applying Agile use Scrum. Okay. So for five years running, it was 55%. The Scrum Guide's only 13 pages. Doing Agile appears easy. Okay. But being Agile actually takes courage and discipline. So I want to give you all a couple of moments um, to take some notes, and I'll take a couple of questions if you've got them before I wrap up. Sasha, am I doing okay on time? Okay. If you want this presentation delivered for free at your organization, shoot this QR code, reach out to me. It's business development for me. I've got other presentations. You can also reach out to me with other ones. I've given conference talks, y'all, in Europe, in Asia, all around the US. In fact, in two weeks, I'm speaking at the Global Scrum Gathering in New Orleans. You've just seen my talk. Thank you for letting me practice here. Okay, so I've got a bunch of these things that I can bring in for a lunch and learn if you're interested. Reach out, contact me. I've also got a YouTube channel. Okay, you can get there with Powered by Teams slash YouTube. Remember to like, subscribe, and share. If any of you are in job search, I've got a whole playlist of videos in job about job search because I was out of work for 15 months after that job at HP and I had to like reinvent myself. And I've got strategies in there for how to have the job chase you. I had a student reach out to me after two years back in January, um, showed him that stuff. And he just let me know this week that he applied it and it helped him get in uh, in a candidate pool of about 190 people and he got the job. Okay, so really like, subscribe, and share. Like, don't bogart it. Give it, give it to your friends. Okay, nobody's got questions for me. I'm not seeing anything in chat, so I'm going to move to wrap up. Remember, okay, that Agile's leverage is really all about mindset. Uh, okay, it's really uh, there, is a question, uh, sorry. Uh, there is a question in the chat uh, from Kevin. What are the best ways you have found for PMs to release from plan and predict? Right, and I did talk about that with situational leadership and learning to like um, develop some coaching and mentoring skills. Cool. So um, recognize, okay, that any organization has a certain amount of inertia, particularly if they were formed before the internet and they've got a certain mindset and it's really resistant. The tools, the processes, the practices that you're familiar with with Agile, they're not enough. You got to stretch further out here. You got to get the mindset. It's really squishy. Those plan and predict organizations, it makes them nervous and uncomfortable. So one of the things you can do is start to shift their beliefs. You can bring me in to give one of these talks. That can start to shift beliefs, y'all. And then that makes it easy to shift people's behaviors. That's really what you're doing. And I want to encourage you in the whole idea of empiricism that Agile is founded on to make new mistakes. Thank you very much for your time and attention. My name's Bernie Maloney. You can stay in touch with me with that contact QR code that's there, and I'll take any questions. Uh, real, real quick, can you go back to the previous slide? I sure can. Before I before you ask, Andy, um, this is where I'd like some quick feedback from y'all. 
okay? And if you're not on camera, please put this into chat, okay? Uh, and if you're on camera, you can do it either in chat um, or here. I'd like to do um, fist to five, okay? I wanna take a couple of pulls. Five is high, fist is low. Okay, five or zero, okay? Um, so um, how much value did you receive out of this talk for your time spent? Fist to five, ready, steady, go. Cool. Okay. Is Sam, Sammy, I, I need new glasses. Was that a three or a four? I'm good with either one. Yeah, it was three. 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 Okay. Awesome. I'd love to hear from you at some point, like how I could do better. Okay. Cool. Okay. Uh, thanks, Andy. Um, not, not so much a question, but I, I there was some feedback on this. I really like this visual because um, it shows, it shows how the, how the, how the, um, the right side is going to tip over if you have the mindset, the behaviors and beliefs. They're bigger, they're more valuable, they make the shift happen. Um, I've been trying to go through this in my own mind, and I really like this visual. Um, the, the thing about behaviors and beliefs, so the mindset is, it happens continuously in small bites over and over again. There's no one big thing you can do to change somebody's mindset, right? There's no ooh, ooh, presentation. Ooh. There's no, you know, there's ooh. no single. I, I, so I, I would agree with your points, but mm, now I'm going to make y'all an offer. Okay, but finish finish what you got going there, Andy. Yeah, you're going mean, to you're gonna have to turn off the recording for the offer, Sasha. Unless unless but not yet. Unless there's a, a monetization behind all this where you can tell us the one sentence that's going to change everybody's mindset. It's something that happens every day, every conversation, whether it's one-on-one -on -one with a team member, with a team in a, in a program level meeting or with stakeholders. Continuously adjust the behaviors and beliefs with comments, with actions, with proving value that is being uh, done day after day, sprint after sprint, you know, quarter after quarter. Um, so I, I really like this visual. I, I think it's extremely powerful, um, but I would challenge everyone on this call and everyone that I talk to that you have the empowerment to do this, but it's consistent. It's, it's every day. It's every conversation where you can do this. Two thumbs up, fully, fully support. Because people are going to backslide. There's that counterweight that's there, y'all. There's always that counterweight. Karen, what do you got? So for this slide, I would suggest that you have, I mean, right now, the existing system is winning. Right? <laughs> so I, I, I would suggest seeing progression so that the right side becomes the more dominant thank you and you know what what it takes to do that thank you um cool okay so i really do want to encourage you like make new mistakes one of the ways you can do this is run experiments y'all okay if you frame things up as let's run an experiment Okay, you're inviting empiricism into the situation. Trust me, people are curious. They like to learn things. They like to win. But then run a retro, no matter what happens. Okay, Ooh, what do we learn from that? What would we do differently the next time? And then let's run another experiment. So if you start to frame things up like that, now you're getting into problems to solve rather than solutions to build. Cool. Okay, Sasha, if you want to wrap up, then I want to like talk about some stuff with, with folks, but after you're done with the recording. <laughs>